Hey everybody and welcome back. This is Dave Bioberonic. This is our second video chat. Some people have asked if they've missed some and nope, this is the second one. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk this time for about 40 minutes about uh, Tomcats, Top Gun, Fighter Tactics, the movie Top Gun, and whatever uh, pops up into our brains. I've got Ben Gavaris here and Mark to uh, provide... <laughs> This is unscripted, unrehearsed, and uh, we're, we're going to have more of a conversation this time. Yep. Let me give some introductory notes. First, I am here representing myself. I am uh, not representing the Navy. I'm not representing the Top Gun Squadron. Uh, second, my background, I was a radar intercept officer, or RIO, in the F-14 Tomcat, and I was also a Top Gun instructor. And based on those experiences, I wrote a book called Top Gun Days, and since, that, uh, since writing that book, doing the research for the book, uh, gathering references and things like that, I've met a lot of interesting people. And so this talk is aimed primarily at the uh, DCS uh, flight sim community. But uh, if, if you've stumbled onto this video on YouTube then, uh, and you've gotten this far, maybe you'll find it interesting also. Always a pleasure. Today's second uh, session is going to have four parts. The uh, main topic is going to be uh, fighter intercepts. Uh, this will be of interest to, uh, to people who uh, fly sims with radars in them. It will also be of interest uh, to anybody that flies sims based on your, uh, your setup, your starting conditions. Uh, if you want to try the uh, back seat, the Rio seat in the F-14 simulator that's upcoming from DCS, and there is an F-14 simulator coming, you probably know that by now. Uh, I'm going to talk about using the radar some, but also talk about other things such as aircraft positioning, uh, airspeed, crew coordination, lookout responsibilities, weapons employment, things like that. That's all part one. <laughs> part two is going to be answering questions that people have submitted. Um, part, we got some good questions this time. Part three is going to be a, a few stories on squadron life. And part four is going to be my uh, book recommendation. Uh, okay, so let's get started on part one, and, and feel free to interrupt uh, if, if I need to delve into something. <laughs> as long as you'll let me. So, uh, fighter intercepts, uh, an interesting topic in, uh, in theory, uh, when, when radars were developed and people in the 1950s started planning the future, they thought that jets would be armed with radars and they'd go out and look for other jets, launch missiles, kill people or, or destroy other airplanes without people seeing each other, things like that. But as experience in Vietnam pointed out, uh, there was a lot more, it was a lot more dynamic environment, not as, not as clean, not as sanitized. And, and that has been uh, somewhat upheld in uh, more recent conflicts. Although we certainly learned a lot from Vietnam, and so we've, we've gotten back into the ability to, uh, to actually run an intercept in a combat environment. Now, when you say in Vietnam the area wasn't sanitized, you're talking about you've got a bunch of F-4s that go into an area where they're supposed to operate, and instead of being able to use their radar to uh, confirm that this guy's a bad guy, they can't see, they can't figure it out. They had, like you said in the last video, you gotta go confirm this guy. Some of that, some of that is correct. They, they couldn't confirm it was a bad guy. You had uh, F-4s going in the operating area, but you also had F-105s in the area. Mm -hmm. You had Navy A-1s and A, you know, Navy F-4s and Air Force F-4s. It was, it was uh, very complicated. Uh, but some of the other problems were also technical. The, uh, the radar, there's something called IFF, Yep. That, that people are aware of, but, but there's reasons uh, why IFF may not work the way you intend it. And, and the uh, command and control over there decided, I don't want to go into that, you can look it up. Okay. Command and control over there decided that lack of IFF was not a good enough reason to shoot uh, over Vietnam. Uh, I mean, the guy's IFF could be broken. He could have battle okay. damage, just for, for one example. Another, another problem was, as happened in Vietnam, uh, our planes were flying over hostile airfields. So, so you may be flying and they could take off behind you. You cannot run an intercept on a person behind you. Okay, 
So, and, and that's the way it is in many combat environments. We're flying over hostile territory. They could be, they could be uh, hiding in valleys, doing visual combat air patrol, etc. So for a lot of reasons, the, the combat environment is not as clean as you might wish. And actually, in training, uh, we realize that, and we train air crews to that. So I'll talk about that as we talk about the intercept. So, so remind me if, if I forget about that. Oh, well. <laughs> but with all that being said... When I was planning my lecture in Top Gun, I did some research, and I remember finding out that, that uh, there were a lot of radar intercepts of 20 miles or more. Now, it's not a long range, but 20 miles, a 20-mile setup is great. You can do a lot to influence the uh, geometry of the airplanes. Um, you, you can get your mind in the, in the right mode. You can make, your, make sure your switches are set up, and all these things that were very important back on the early jet fighters and now have, uh, have become less and less of a challenge. For example, switchology. Switchology nowadays is much better than it was on the fighters from the 50s and the 60s. Okay. Okay. Also in, uh, in Desert Storm, where there were uh, dozens of air, air kills, we, there, were some, you know, there were a lot of radar intercepts run. Mm -hmm. And so you could tell that in the, uh, you know, 20 to 30 years after Vietnam, Vietnam ended in 73, Desert Storm was in 90, 91, 18 to 25 years, you know, we learned a lot about employment. And uh, so there is, there is room for a radar intercept. That's actually interesting that you say that because it, you entered your career as... as as Vietnam was winding down. I started flying in 1981, which was uh, eight okay. years after the air, last air combat in Vietnam. Okay. That's when I joined. So when you're squadron. performing your uh, your radar intercept, if if you're a navy uh, if you're a navy fighter, you're probably going to have uh, two jets flying together. Air Force is going to have uh, two or four jets flying together. And actually, Navy has a lot of division tactics also, which is a division is four airplanes. Uh, what you're going to have is uh, that this. When you enter the combat arena, you've got to have your switches set up. You've got to have your airplane configured for combat. In other words, um, you know, tanks, missile launch switches, weapon select, everything should be ready to go once you once you either leave the airfield, uh, leave the aircraft carrier, and go uh, feet dry over hostile territory, etc. It's called fence checks. It's called combat checklists. Things like that. Uh, so, you, were you master arm on once you got off the carrier? No, no. Because I'm talking about one, my experience. We flew in peacetime. Okay. I I flew, and in fact, I mean, I did fly over other, uh, Operation Southern Watch over Iraq. Mm -hmm. We did not turn master arm on. Um, as I recall, we did not turn master arm on because we were Southern Watch. It but, wasn't combat, it right. was... But, but everyone was uh, spring-loaded, Master Arm would be on, and everything else was set up. I mean, we, you know, our uh, countermeasures were, were set up, everything was hot. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, so okay. you're ready to go. Radar, you got to uh, sanitize the, uh, your assigned scan volume or your threat sector. And this, this all goes into uh, mission planning. You got to consider your uh, radar look angle, mm -hmm. Your radar scan volume, how many aircraft do you have? What's the expected threat? I'm, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. These are things, that, I mean, you don't have to tell me what's the expected threat. I'm saying when you're doing your mission planning, you've got to think, what is my expected threat? And you set up your radar to counter for this. If you're flying a against a bunch of guys with uh, older airplanes or, or less capable airplanes, you're not going to need to look at 45, 50,000 feet. Okay. If you're flying against people with uh, high, fast flyers, well, then you get better make sure at least someone is looking up at high altitude and long range. Okay. Uh, in addition, you have to plan uh, coordination with your uh, external controlling agency, whether it's AWACS, E2, uh, a Navy ship, because Navy ships with Aegis have incredible radar capability. It's amazing. You're looking at, you're looking towards a threat. The intercept will begin when either the fighter obtains a contact, one of the fighters obtains contact, or the controlling agency 
gives you a vector. Okay. The uh, vector radio call is going to be uh, most likely with relation to a fixed geographic point. That's uh, a bullseye call. And the benefit of that is that uh, many people can, uh, can, can use that information, can leverage that information. If the controller says, okay, fighter, your target is 340 at 52 miles, there's only one, one or two airplanes that can use that. That's the fighters that he's talking to. But if the controller says your target is 20 miles south of uh, Point Charlie, everybody that's been briefed on Point Charlie knows exactly where that is. So, so once the fighters start to, uh, to, to begin the intercept, then I got to tell you the the pace in their in their heart and in their brain. I mean, your brain goes into overdrive. You you start getting more excited. But if you're well trained and you're prepared, then you will be able to control that. You know, you you can control the adrenaline. And in fact, that was my experience in training flights uh, when we would do a two versus unknown, and we're especially briefing some unusual scenario where the, uh, the adversaries were using uh, deceptive tactics or whatever. I, I didn't get all beaded up about it. I'm sitting there going, okay, this is what we're training for. This is what we're here to do. And uh, yeah, you're excited, you're alert, you're paying attention, but you can handle it. Uh, and you have to become professional. And that's what, that's what training does for you. But that's a whole nother talk. <laughs> okay, so, so the, uh, the handling of the radar... It's got to be uh, agreed to before time, and, and I'm not going to give you actual range uh, numbers mm -hmm. because uh, it's very situation dependent. It's dependent on what kind of airplane you're flying. But just for, as an example, you may want to say from uh, initial detection, two fighters begin their intercept. The, the, the person with the initial contact may become the tactical lead. So if the wingman gets first, first contact, he may become the lead, so there's a lead change. Those are things that you know if you're if you're doing DCS and you have two guys flying, you got to make sure you know who's lead and who's wingman. So there's a quick radio call that could be a lead change, or you know if the lead if the mission planning was good, the lead's going to get the first contact because he's looking in the right spot. Uh, so whoever's got the first contact, tack lead, painting the uh, enemy formation. They uh, depending on radar modes. They may stay in uh, search if they have track. You know, if they can uh, obtain target track while they're searching, and they can uh, break out multiple airplanes in the formation. There's uh, four guys in a box, yep. or there's two guys in trail, or whatever. Now, four guys in a box is not a professional radio call, but you get the idea, so to speak. Uh, then you you might have the wingman say, okay, he's going to sanitize his assigned. Uh, search area until 20 miles and then at 20 miles he says mine is clear I'm gonna look at the same guys that we are uh, I'm gonna look at the guys that we're targeting now this was uh, several people asked me questions about this in that email how do you decide you know when to uh, keep searching the formation when to take locks to launch missiles etc again it's briefed one thing that you don't want to do it, and it's a judgment call. You don't want to wait too long to take your lock, you know, sit there and scan, look at the formation, look at the formation, identify the formation, and then you've missed your chance for your first missile launch. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's important to have a timeline, a well-designed timeline, and to stick to it. And this is where, uh, you know, single-seat fighters... Uh, Single seat fighter pilots, they can handle it. They do handle it all over the place. I was uh, in a two seat fighter, and my pilot would would help me out if I needed it. Now, on a good run, he didn't help me at all. And at the end of the run, he'd go, man, bio, that was great. And I'd say the same thing to him. But, you know, the uh, the lead and wingman may make uh, prompting radio calls, you know, going, going to a uh, track or brake lock or whatever. That's interesting that you say that because that is a there is no way to linearly train somebody how to properly enter into a fight in That's DCS. That's right. What you, okay, so in DCS, what you've got to do is look at the things that we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. You've got to uh, keep tabs on your own performance. 
you've got to give yourself an objective debrief. And that was something that the, uh, that the professional training programs learned. They made the debriefs objective, and it, but they made them hard-hitting. They did not make them personal. They didn't make them insulting. They made them professional and objective. And so if you're in DCS and you want to improve your performance, and that's why we're doing these video chats, you need to keep tabs on your performance and decide what you did well and what you need to change. That means that, yeah, you uh, agree. Did, uh, okay. A little better, better flying means keeping, keeping track of what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong right. and scrutinizing that. Right. Okay, so let me keep moving. I've talked about the radar a lot. Uh, what to do with the aircraft. The speed that you're on uh, cap or that you're waiting before the intercept, the speed that you're flying your mission at, is probably, it, it's going to be not your uh, intercept speed. It's going to be a little bit more conservative so you can remain on station for a longer period of time. F-14 was an excellent example. F-14 could fly around, and I know the F-14 is retired, but it could fly around at 225 knots and stay airborne, you know, all day. Not all day, but it seemed like it. But once it started the intercept, it would bump up the speed to uh, 400, 450 or more. Uh, contemporary fighters are more of the same. They, they, if they're orbiting on station, then they will not be at their intercept speed. They'll, they may be down around 325 or something. They can add the energy quickly so they don't, so they don't have to worry too much about, you know, okay, I'm at, I've got to stay at 400 knots. Uh, they can stay at a more conservative airspeed. But then when the intercept starts, they'll want to bump up the speed. And this is uh, going to also be impacted by their, uh, their missile launch missile launch and missile defensive considerations. I mean, this, this gets incredibly complex. If you're, if you're fighting against an airplane that can shoot at you, then higher speed by your airplane increases his shot ability. So, well... Speed of the target is one of the determinants about the range, effective range of a missile. Okay. And, and you've got to learn all this stuff, uh, but, but contemporary fighter pilots and, and WIZOs, they do this. They study it, they practice it, they debrief it, and they learn it. So for the DCS guys, you're probably going to want to fly your intercept. I'm going to just give you a ballpark figure of around 425 to 450, just a good general starting point. Gives you a lot of options. Uh, in our last chat that we had uh, a couple of months ago, we talked about the tactical formation. You want to fly a wider formation going in. Uh, you don't want to fly, you know, air show formation. It looks good on the ground, but it'll get both of you killed. It makes the job easier for the enemy and reduces your options. I'm glad to hear you finally say that. Yeah. There is, for some reason, and whenever I fly in DCS, everybody decides they will. We're gonna, we're gonna be able to look at serial numbers. Well, that's fun. That's fun. It looks cool. You sit there and you enjoy it. But okay, that's fun if you're flying. But that's not the way you want to fly if you're in a hostile environment. Okay, if you're in the, uh, if you're in two single seat airplanes, then both guys have to uh, have to take care of all the lookout uh, considerations. Uh, even the person who's a tactical lead, who is focused on prosecuting this attack on these airplanes, he has got to, in my experience, he would donate, he would dedicate some of his time to defensive lookout, to, uh, yeah, to defensive lookout. Now, again, my experience was a two-seat airplane. There were times in the intercept when I was committed to defensive lookout. I would operate the radar, and I would defensively look out. Um, if you're in two single-seat airplanes, then it's going to be the lead and the wingman that manage that lookout doctrine. Just another real-world example. When I was going through Top Gun as a student way back in 1982, which was a long time ago, but Top Gun had something called a wild card. They would have a guy, super high altitude, out of the fight, but we knew he was a hostile because he was briefed, and he would test our lookout. And then when I went back as an instructor, we did it to class fighters. We'd hang up, you know, well above them. And on the intercept, we'd roll in on them. And if they saw us, that's it. That tested their lookout. They'd get, they'd get to uh, disregard that guy. He would not tangle up with them. He just tested them. Uh, finally, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, communication. 
it's important that the tech lead, whether it's a Wizzo, pilot, whatever, that his initial contact be directive. Uh, I'm, I'm going back to my early days of my training because I'm talking to DCS people who, who are in the early phases of improving their, improving their performance. And so one of, when you get this magic radar, you get this beautiful picture, and you can see things, one of the human tendencies is to describe it. Oh, I can see three airplanes. They're in a wedge, you know. And No. First thing you got to do is quick analysis of the picture. Say, okay, these guys are, are going. They're presenting to the left target aspect. I've got four quarter missiles. I need to get to flight path. So let's... So, you know, my initial shot, my initial view is left target aspect. So let's steady up, let's come left and go get on their flight path. Just, just an option. Not always what you want to do, but it's an option. So it's not just about recognizing the fighter and heading straight to it. It's about analyzing the picture and then trying to put yourself in a more advantageous position. Direct, that, it's directive comp. That's right. That's it, another thing about DCS is... They, they, uh, the picture comes in, and they go straight at it. Yeah, and it's, well, uh, you know, and, and uh, Ben, I, you know, I'm not going to be critical of guys, because guys, oh, yeah. are, guys are doing it for fun, yeah. and that is fun. But we're going to talk about taking it to the next level. And and these are things to consider, things to think about. And, they, again, these things that, that I'm telling you, uh, these are, you know, the first few weeks or the first few days of the Top Gun class or uh, training in this fighter squadron or whatever. So, uh, as you get closer, uh, you, you may have medium range missiles, depending on your launch criteria, you're going to uh, launch missiles. If you've got two fighters, uh, you need to have a good sort plan. Uh, radar sort is when you decide who's going to shoot at which airplane in the formation. Right, another simple example, lead will shoot at the lead, wingman will shoot at anybody but the lead. You know, he'll shoot at a trailer, he'll shoot at the dash two and the enemy, whatever. You don't want both guys shooting at the same target. That's wasting a missile. Yep. Then you have to consider missile defenses based on, uh, on the uh, enemy's missiles. That is a very complex uh, subject. But one thing that I'll tell you, something to think about, is if you're going against, um, you know, uh, fighters that can shoot you in the face, when you manage your target aspect to them, uh, you are affecting what they can, you know, their missile launch range. And that is that, that a, uh, a missile's range is dependent on the fighter's maneuvering. So if a fighter is flying through the air at, say, uh, 400, 450 knots, and the missile is flying towards it, well, the fighter is helping that missile get there. Yes. But in an extreme case, if the fighter is flying across, then the missile's got to fly way out in front of him to get to make the intercept happen. And so everything that the, that the uh, target does with his nose, that's target aspect, it affects the uh, missile launch envelope. Okay. And so you can, be, by placing yourself in a certain aspect to him you're actually either helping the missile, but if you fire from an off aspect angle, like so, yeah. that's, then that's okay. But whereas well, and, zero aspect. And every, no, every missile's got different capabilities. You, you that's know, true. And what you're doing, and so when we first started this intercept, remember I talked about getting yep. to flight path? Mm -hmm. Then after you've got your missiles launched, you've got to remember that you need to manage his launch range. So you've got to turn your airplane maybe to, to um, give him a shorter launch range. That's a lot of so stuff a lot to of things to think about. Yeah. So, and remember, you're going 420 to 450 or 500 knots. He's doing the same thing. 20 miles, it takes about a minute. So this all happens very fast. I was going to say, how did, you, how did you, outside of setting up a mental checklist for yourself, the idea of these two things closing at each other a thousand miles an hour, like you said, you got about a minute. You, that's really not a lot of time. Here's the amazing thing, and I remember this. this I still I like actually thinking about this because it reminds me. And believe me, this story is not, I was such a great Rio, because, <laughs> because, because I was typical. 
So I'm saying I was typical. There were, you know, there were guys that were, there were guys better than me. I was good, but anyway, okay, the story is, I was doing an intercept, and we were uh, working against higher speed targets. They were going 600 knots. Most of our intercepts were more tactical at 350 to 450, but these guys were 600. We were going 600. We were all using uh, forward quarter missiles, which was kind of new back in the mid-80s, because there were not a lot of threat countries that had forward quarter missiles. And I remember being inside of 20 miles, so with less than a minute to go, mm -hmm. mileage is clicking down really fast. I'm looking at the uh, picture on my search radar, which was a manual mode, and I'm wisecracking to my pilot <laughs> just because I had the mental, I had the bandwidth. I'm wisecracking to my pilot, you know, oh, we've got this suitcase, <laughs> Wingman's going to lock one guy, we'll get the other guy, and then we'll get the hell out of here and all this stuff. I just remember thinking that, and then and then it happened, you know, wisecrack, okay, time to take a lock, yep, got two locks, take our shots, and all that. Now, you got to keep doing that, because years later, when I was back in the situation, it was difficult to, to repeat that performance, I'll be candid with you. <laughs> Okay, so let me close out this intercept and move on to the other uh, parts of the discussion. <clears throat> we shot missiles. We've managed the enemy's uh, missile launch range. Uh, we are now getting into visual uh, visual detection range, and this de this depends on uh, this is going to be impacted by what's your mission. Do you have to destroy these guys? Or are you just trying to disrupt them? Or are you trying to distract them? And how much risk can you accept? You know, uh, your mission in DCS is probably going to be get engaged and have fun. So you're going to want to close with them. So as you get two airplanes close to the uh, in visual range, and for most fighters, for most people out in the real world, it was, you know, six to eight miles, different conditions. You might have a longer visual acquisition. Certainly, everyone's seen airplanes at. 12, 15 miles more, <clears throat> you've got to very concisely say who, what you see and what you're doing. So the lead may say, uh, Cali 2, left 1130, you know, left 1130 low, or, uh, you know, targeting the lead. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they're in, uh, they're in trail, they're in combat spread, which means they're flying next to each other. You've got to say all that very quickly, targeting the lead. And then the wingman should know he's got to target the wingman because he doesn't have the option to go into a defensive, you know, or into a, uh, a covering position. If it's two versus two, you're both engaged. Yep. And the comm has to be quick. It has to use standardized terms. That's key. And it's got to be accurate, and it's got to be directive. So these are just some things to remember uh, about comm that we've talked about. If it's a pilot in a Rio, uh, their comm has to be professional. And, and my little story where I was telling you where I was flying inside of 20 miles and I made a wisecrack to my pilot, not professional, but so don't do that, kids. <laughs> Too late. But anyway. Okay, so, so that's enough thoughts about the, the intercept. Uh, you know, when I'm talking about this, sometimes it feels like I'm, I'm, I'm lecturing or I'm setting the standards high. But the point of this, and my frame of reference is training people for combat. You've got to set the standards high. Otherwise, people will go out there, they'll fail at the mission, they'll get killed, etc. And then the thing that I always remind myself, or if I'm talking to people about it, you're flying a jet fighter. It is fun. And doing it better, doing it well, is a challenge but it's fun and rewarding. So, you know, I mean, just keep trying, uh, keep trying to do better, and and that's uh, that adds it. We've coffee all recharged our coffee cup. cups, so... Eat it. Or our water cups. Yeah, water. Water's good, too. You're doing all right. Oh, I'm wide awake. I, I know. Knowing you. <laughs> Let's move into now the, uh, the questions. And uh, these came from emails. We put out a call uh, for, some, for questions and then uh, selected some that, that I can talk about. One of them is how to engage a high fast flyer, and the uh, the typical high fast flyer, of course, SR seventy one, long retired, but uh, the uh, Mig Mig uh, 
25 Foxbat was a good one, which is now morphed into the MiG-31, but also other airplanes flying uh, high and fast. The, uh, one of the biggest challenges is uh, target aspect control. Uh, we're going to assume that you have a, uh, a missile that can hit them. The uh, AIM-54 could definitely fly up there. Uh, it could definitely attack a uh, Mach 3 target. One of, the, one of the challenges was that when a target is moving at Mach 3, the missile has to calculate lead. Uh, it has to pull a lot of lead. Okay. So you're having to, the missile, since it's going so fast, it's not just trying to steer itself to a point here. It's really well, having to look way. further. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're going this way. Oh, okay. So aspect is zero. Yes. Okay. That, and, and because of that, because of that uh, lead requirement, if you're shooting against the high fast flyer, you've got a very, you said aspect is zero. You do have a very narrow window that, uh, that you can get into where you have uh, uh, launch acceptability. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Because uh, if, if you're going uh, even, say, uh, Mach 0.9, Mach 1, the missile's going to accelerate to Mach 4, Mach 5. But if the target is going at Mach 3, he's covering a lot of ground very quickly, and the missile's got to get in front of it. That's right. So if you're not in low target aspect, then the missile just will have no chance to get there. And... I mean, you'll be off, if, if you're, say, 20 degrees, even if you're at long range, the missile will try to fly out and, uh, and intercept the target, but it, it just won't have the dynamic ability to do so. It's gonna okay, so high fast flyer, manage target aspect, uh, keep it low. Another uh, consideration is um, when, is, is you're going to have a very narrow uh, period of time when you can uh, push the launch button, when you can squeeze the trigger or whatever. And uh, again, this is because everything happens very quickly. If you wait too long, then the target is going to be too close and the missile is going to be in the end game uh, and it's not going to have the energy to make the intercept. So there's a very short window where it's an uh, acceptable launch. The reason I know this because in the F-14 simulator, I practiced uh, shooting against high fast targets. It's something we train to. Most F-14 squadrons got to fly against the SR-71, and so uh, everyone said that, you know, it, it happens very fast, and you've got to be in the right place, and you've got to be on your toes. Quick question about that, real quick. W they would have you coming oh, yeah. at each other? Yeah, we had set up, it was very carefully scripted, uh, because otherwise everybody would be wasting their time. So we would have the F-14s out in the working area off the coast of San Diego, mm -hmm. SR-71s would come down, they'd hit certain points, and the Tomcats would be in position to, uh, to try to make simulated intercepts, inter mi simulated missile launches. Okay. There was, there was no thought at, during those exercises of joining up on the SR-71. That would have been cool. <laughs> but. Okay, so then when you're talking about the real world, if it has to be so scripted, uh, how, how could it possibly... How could you possibly hope for this to work in the real world? Well, the thought is that, or one thought is, that the Tomcats or the, the Cap, and, and forgive me for always talking about Tomcats, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defend that by saying, you know, we're talking about DCS F-14s. Okay, so just let me have that one. Okay, so the Cap is defending a target, a known target. And so the, the enemy has to come towards that target. So to some extent, they're managing target aspect for you because they are heading to the target. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, if this coffee cup is your target and this is your cap, well, a guy flying over here, you won't make the intercept, but he's not a threat either. Now, if he turns this way, then you better have someone over here. And this is where your mission planning, threat analysis, things like that take effect. Uh, F-14s did a lot of training to defend against high-fast flyers in the simulator also. So, Were those effective um, missions that you train on? Would oh, yeah. You, were... you learned something. That's effective training. When, when you think about scripted fighting and flying and so forth, um, in DCS, we, 
where we're trying to figure things out, we, you have to remember that it is a very non-linear thought process to a linear process. Oh, well, that, I was going to answer that. Uh, I was going to reply to your comment earlier, and that is one of the benefits of training. It's mm -hmm. not rote training. It's In some cases, you need to have step one, step two, step three. But in all cases, that training gives you a knowledge base to deal with the unknown. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let me move to another question. Top Gun presentation rules. And this is something that I talk about in my book, Top Gun Days. And it was something that I noticed when I went through Top Gun as a student, and then when I went back as an instructor, it was, uh, it was demanded because that's a performance standard. But when you're a Top Gun instructor lecturing in front of the class, you don't wear a watch, you, you uh, stand correctly, you do certain things with your hands, you never put your hands in your pocket. When you write on the whiteboard, you have to write neatly. Now, as I say to, uh, to people, this was not harassment. It's not a game. The guys that made these rules uh, were, the guys that started Top Gun, they were combat veterans. They were fighter pilots. You know, they weren't, they weren't playing games. There was a reason they did that, and the reason was to uh, reduce variation, to reduce distractions among students. So the students focused on the material and not, oh, look at that guy. Man, he's got a nice watch. You know, or, yeah, what, what's that guy writing? His writing is uh, not neat. Also, for accuracy, we had to be very careful when we were de debriefing the fight because uh, you have to draw accurate pictures, and the reason is that uh, it, it indicates whether you had valid shots, whether you were turning at, uh, you know, max performance turn, all these other things. So you, you have to be accurate. Now, these are the days uh, we couldn't use the uh, tax range, ACE air combat maneuvering. In. We couldn't use that all the time. So we did have to do a lot of board debriefs. So Top Gun presentation rules, they held instructors to a, a high standard. Since I'm not giving a Top Gun lecture today, I'm wearing my watch. <laughs> That's actually one of my favorite parts about your book is the notes on professionalism. Yeah, it's professional. And it's actually helped me at uh, where, where we were. Um, in presentations, so Somebody, if you haven't read it, read it. <laughs> so, so continuing with the questions, uh, someone asked about the F-14's TV sensor, which was called the TCS or Television Camera Set. It was uh, it was a a um, under the nose of the F-14. It could be uh, either slave to the radar, uh, or it could just be um, looking forward. It had a 4 power and a 10 power magnification, and one of the biggest limitations was it did not have a very wide field of view. It could only gimbal about uh, 10 degrees, I think. The concept was the concept for TCS came out of Vietnam. As we talked about earlier, you had to have visual identification before you could uh, take a shot. And so they thought, oh, if you have a 4X or a 10X TV camera, you'll be able to visually identify a guy just a few miles further and get the shot off. Uh, especially for an AIM-7 Sparrow. So it came out of Vietnam. The F-4 had uh, a television camera in some versions. Mm -hmm. The F-14, which, you know, learned a lot of Vietnam lessons, they, they put the camera on. In my experience, the TCS was not a huge uh, factor. And this guy asked, you know, how did it work? How well did it work? <clears throat> I just remember that in, in my training environments, uh, I don't remember getting a whole lot of benefit out of TCS. So maybe that was one of my shortcomings as a Rio. I'll admit that. I don't know. But uh, and, and other F-14 guys would have, to, uh, would have to chime in. You know, you'd have to take a poll. Uh, yeah. That would be an interesting poll. We should do when, that. When I was a Top Gun instructor, I remember guys coming through the class every once in a while... In the debrief, they would say, we used the TCS, we got a, a VID, so we called the shot. But um, it just wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a, a whiz-bang, gee-whiz system, uh, is my recollection. Then I'm going to answer one more uh, question that uh, somebody sent me, and that is, this is, a, this is a very good question, and this kind of thing that uh, in DCS, I'm not sure how it's going to be mechanized. <laughs> Does the radar in a fourth-generation fighter 
such as the F-14, and this would probably apply to fifth generation, although I haven't been in an F-22, <laughs> which is a good thing. Does it stay parallel to the horizon when in a turn, or does it remain in line with the aircraft? And so that's the way the question was asked, and the, the terms are, this is a good question because the, uh, we had earth stabilized and aircraft stabilized in the F-14. So the radars swept back and forth. Now they have electronically scanned radars, but they still look back and forth electronically. And if it's aircraft stabilized, then when you roll the plane, the radar is skewed. And so we flew around 99% of the time in stabilization in or earth stabilized. So when you rolled the plane, the antenna maintained a track parallel to the ground because that was that gave you a much more stable picture and it was uh, more con you know allowed the radar to build a more consistent consistent uh, picture track file etc so but there was a switch in the F14 where you could have stab in stab out for the radar antenna there was one uh, short range radar mode in the F14 where the radar went when you activated that mode it went stab out and it it's uh, the field of view was relative to the airplane. And they explained, you know, in the training, they explained how, when you would use that. And I think I might have used that, you know, twice in 2,600 hours. So <laughs> stab out was not, was not for me. Okay, that's all the questions I got. And one reason, you know, I'm moving along now because I'm watching the clock and we're getting yeah. towards our, our time. <clears throat> Part yep. three. Squadron life. Did I? Yeah, squadron life. Okay, so I thought about what, what am I going to say about squadron life, and I'm going to talk about two things, because Ben, you've been bugging, not bugging me, you've been suggesting I talk about this. One squadron life story is actually Navy life, and that's called crossing the line. It's also called wog day, because polywogs are people that have never been across the equator. So if you do any research, you'll see that crossing the equator goes back centuries, you know, till, till the first people realized there was an equator. And in my experience, and, and it's definitely evolved over time, uh, I went through crossing the line in the early 1980s on my first deployment when we crossed the equator. And it was, uh, there was a lot of buildup. So it, it makes a big mess out of the ship. I mean, it, is, it was pretty elaborate. The problem was that some things, I mean, I, I personally wasn't injured. I don't know anyone that was injured. But the problem is that a small percentage of people can get carried away. A small percentage of people, uh, it, it just it gets ugly fast if it gets out of hand. And so crossing the line ceremonies have evolved. Uh, as far as I can tell, the Navy is still doing them. Um, they have to be handled carefully. They have to be uh, supervised and things. But, but I will tell you that when my crossing the line ceremony in 1981, we, we were uh, the polywogs. We'd never crossed the line. We, were, we had to crawl around the ship on our hands and knees around the whole aircraft carrier. And one of the most amazing... And then, and then about half the crew was already shellbacks. So they had these big lengths of old fire hose. They were slapping them on the deck. And one of the most amazing things that, I can, that I've ever seen was when we went into the hangar for like the intermediate part of the ceremony, this huge hangar bay on an aircraft carrier, which is hundreds of feet long and, you know, 40 feet high. Or it's just, and there's just hundreds of people yelling and slapping and making noise. It was something like out of a horror movie or something. They were like, ah, they're waiting for us. You know? and then they take you up on the flight deck and, and the flight deck is a mess with people. Oh, it's just, it was amazing. It's pretty amazing. I, I do not have nightmares about it now, but if I ever do, I, I can understand. The second squadron ceremony was something that we did in my squadron, I think a lot of squadrons did, was at the conclusion of a detachment. We had a kangaroo court. And that was where, I believe it was the squadron EXO in the Navy squadron. He's the executive officer, second in command. And I believe he would preside over the court 
and people would read offenses and the EXO would fine you and uh, it was it was just uh, a lot of fun. You know, was, you would talk about guys and the offenses could be anything from uh, non-professionalism and flying uh, to, uh, you know, wearing... Uh, Wearing socks that didn't match, you know, when you went out to the to dinner or whatever, you know. Uh, it was just a, a kangaroo court, and it was just a lot of fun to finish up a, a deployment. <laughs> and we did that, you know, in several squadrons. We did it a lot. Okay, so that's my little squadron life uh, glimpses. Uh, I want to recommend a book also. I think a lot of people that watch this uh, maybe uh, may read, may do some reading. Completes the uh, squadron life tales. Uh, the uh, the final part of the of the talk is I want to recommend a book because I think people uh, people do some reading. And the book that I want to recommend, a book that I've read, is called I Always Wanted to Fly by uh, Colonel Wolfgang Samuel. This is a story. Uh, this happens to be Air Force uh, stories, but it's a story of Cold War flying experiences. It goes it goes over. Uh, Germany, over the Soviet Union, goes into Vietnam. Some of these things involve uh, reconnaissance planes getting shot at or shot down. And it just tells the stories of these people and, and how what they thought and, and how, they, how they did all these things. Great personal stories and great uh, flying adventures. So that's my book for, uh, for this time. We are now coming to the end of the uh, discussion. Do you have any more questions, Mark? Or? <laughs> I've asked all my questions. Okay, good. <laughs> I have one. Ben, go ahead. Where did you hide the bird? You know what story. Can you tell that story, please? That's a wonderful yes. story. Ben's asking where, where I hid the bird. That's because I told him about something that happened one time. When I was uh, in my first squadron, I uh, ejected with the squadron commander. The ejection, that ejection video is on YouTube. I ejected with the squadron commander, and then after that, I flew with the squadron commander exclusively for about another six, eight months that he was in the squadron. So then when he left our squadron, he went to the uh, fighter wing on Miramar, and he just came back, and or he flew with all the different squadrons on the base. And one day he came back, and he flew with our squadron. And he said, hey, Bio, come on, let's go fly a low level. So we went and flew a low level. It was for training, but it was, uh, it was low impact. And I was happy to fly because my job that day was to be the duty officer, which was to sit at the desk and run the squadron. That's, every lieutenant took their turn doing that. So we go out, we fly the low level, we, we get back to the squadron, and uh, you know that was a great flight, jump out of the plane. I go up, I change back into my uniform, I go get the duty desk, and the uh, squadron routine continues. Well, you know, it's about 10 minutes later, the new squadron commander comes up on the uh, on the intercom from maintenance and he goes uh, hey bio who just got out of 107 of 207 it was 207 we're in 200 he goes who got out of 207 I go oh let me look I mean I I didn't even remember I go oh that was me you know I just got off that he goes did you guys do a post flight I go uh, I think so he goes did you know you hit a bird <laughs> no sir why don't you come down here? <laughs> so I, I got off the duty desk. I walked down to maintenance. I go, come on, Skipper. He, he goes, come here, let me show you something. We walked out. We go to the nose of uh, the jet. And there on the nose was a smudge. Just like a smudge, like this long. And it was perfectly in line with the opening for the gun. <laughs> and then... You look into the gun and you look at the back, and there are bones and feathers in the gun gas exhaust. Oh. And so this poor bird hit our nose and went right down the gun and then came out. And I'm going, like, ha, huh, that is the strangest thing. He just, you know, bio, you need to, <laughs> don't ever lose your focus, you know. So You can't miss a bird at 800 miles an hour. No. So that, that's where the bird went. Uh, who knows? Okay, the, the one other thing that I will say, and that is if you're a, a fan of uh, naval aviation, especially aviation in general, F-14s, 
I do have a book coming out again, my second book. It's supposed to come out in uh, March 2016. It's called Before Top Gun Days. It's available now for pre-order on Amazon. And it talks about my experiences uh, going through training in Pensacola in 1980-81 and my training in the F-14 training squadron, the RAG, in 81-82. And besides my personal experiences, I put it into context of Aircraft, you know, aviation operations, fighter operations, and things like that. So I just got a bunch of pictures. Look forward. I think you'll like it. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, we will make an announcement uh, before we do another one.